Hello, I'm Lucia Rabelo de Castro, Professor of Childhood and Youth of the Institute of Psychology, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, co-founder of the Center of Childhood and Youth Studies of the same university. I'll be glad to share with you my discussion on decolonial theories and its articulation with childhood studies. As a scholar whose academic background was in the era of psychology, my initial concerns focused on a critique of the normativity of psychological theories. Here, I'll present the contribution of decolonial theories which go beyond and offer an exceptionally powerful critique for the analysis of knowledge production. I'll begin with a short account of decolonial theories, then I'll foreground its main assets, and finally I'll try to articulate its relevance to childhood studies. Decolonial theorizing can be said to comprehend an array of theories which stand as critiques to the legacies of European modernity, history, science, and civilizational values. It aims at disrupting prevailing forms of knowledge and normativity, standing as universals, in order to forward knowledges otherwise, that is, pluriversal forms of living, knowing, and being. This is shortly what the term decoloniality stands for. Given the recent widespread dissemination of the term decolonial, it's important to trace the genealogy of this term. Basically, it firstly appeared in the 80s of last century in the writings of Latin American academics. Inspired by the critique forwarded by the subaltern studies in India. They set up a program to further radicalize the subaltern perspective and relocate the temporal and spatial incidents of colonialism, both to include the Americas as well as recede it as far back as the 16th century major strands that revindicate a decolonial perspective. One, uh, the first one, who's acknowledged that explicitly refers to the work of the prominent Latin American research group named Modernity Colonial Coloniality Program, whose names are listed here. And the uh, uh, comprising a wide range of critiques. To this day, the writings of this group have been disseminated to different parts of the world, inspiring critiques of development programs in Africa or that advanced by Nidlovo Gatsheni on the need of decolonial thinking as a liberatory language for the African country. A second strand underscores two major issues of decolonial thinking, namely race and territory, foregrounding the claims of indigenous peoples who were enslaved, assassinated, and ripped off their land in the anglo settled colonies of Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. But also this strand also encompasses the African diasporic experience of racism, its relevance for identity, recognition, and knowledge, and its impact on a politics of resistance. And finally, a third strand, comprising a range of critical perspectives which postulate the construction of theories from the South, or Southern theories. Theorizing from the South embodies an amplitude of critique. For instance, the problematization of the universal character of social science knowledge in the international division of academic labor, or 
the affirmation of the counter evolutionary position of the South in the production of value and innovation. Or still, the thematization of creolization processes, which refers to the singularity of the philosophical, ethical, and aesthetic aspects of knowledge in the South. This last strand, contrarily to the first two, and more often than not, deploys the decolonial critique eliding the violent and oppressive compo component of colonization. So the decolonial here seems to resonate in a sort of merely intellectual pursuit for epistemic alternatives and does not entail necessarily a subjective reconstruction and also a political commitment to struggle against and resist domination, inferiorization, and invisibility. My research work has been situated in the decolonial strand that is, in, is in, inspired by the work of Latin American scholars. This, of course, significantly concerns the opening up of possibilities of knowledge construction and reconstruction positioned as a Southern scholar. Now, to give you a schematic view of the epistemic potentialities of decolonial thinking, I must first contextualize it as emergence very briefly. So I go back to the 60s of last century, when a growing ebullience about the future's destiny of the great majority of nations of the South followed the post-war geopolitical consolidation of Europe and the US as imperial powers. In 1955, the Bandung Conference was held in Indonesia as a paradigmatic move of Southern nations the third world that should keep at bay an automatic political alignment both to the first world and the second world countries. Again, in 1966, Cuba hosted the Tricontinental Conference, gathering representatives of anti-imperialist and revolutionary organizations with the objective of creating a united struggle of third world countries against imperialism and of changing the balance of power between global north and global south countries. However, the revolutionary fever that shook third world countries of Latin America, Asia and Africa was met with an even stronger and fiercer counter-offensive by first world countries to suppress revolutionary fervor and maintain the status quo. Many revolutionary leaders in Africa, Latin America, and Asia were assassinated. And the financing, financing of militia and counter-revolutionary armies and direct military interventions in many nations of these country, continents were instrumentalized. The decades to follow attested the rise of neoliberal economic measures after the prescriptions of the Washington Consensus designed to rescue indebted third world emergent countries. In the midst of such a political, economic and ideological turmoil, three major theoretical developments branded as Latin America and le relevant to the de decolonial thinking emerged, namely the economic theory of dependence, the theology of liberation, the pedagogy of the oppressed, all of which were concerned to understand the specific position of Latin America and the geopolitical structure of economic and cultural domination. So for theorists and militants, it seemed urgent to search for an altogether 
different explanation and understanding for the enduring colonial configuration of the world where modernization and development hardly altered the fate of Latin American countries, among others, despite their strivings. So I would underscore three important assets of decolonial thinking. Firstly, as put by Walter Mignolo, decolonial critique implies the linking from our received Euro-American epistemological, epistemological terrain, theories, concepts, and values, to construct knowledge from the borders, that is, from those neglected, subalternized, and silenced time spaces by colonial domination, which stand as different by virtue of one's place of origin, race, and culture. To decolonize is foremostly the comma, the liberation of knowledge, the transformation of colonial subject, subjects and subjectivities into decolonial subjects and subjectivities, end of comma. The linking entails disobedience, and the use of this term by Walter Mignolo is not casual, since disobedience can be a liability. It attracts reprimand, disgust, and punishment. Thus, to the link and eventually think otherwise must be viscerally articulated to an effective mood of resistance, a will to change and a fair state of knowledge and knowing fueling the anger, passion, into the psychic labor of resisting tacit knowledge to construct it otherwise. Knowing otherwise is necessarily modulated by its corporeal component of feeling otherwise, triggered by nonconformity with the status quo. Thus, one needs uh, beginning of comma, an energy of discontentment, of suspicion before imperial violence, end of comma. Thus, rather than a controlled, sovereign, rational effort, the act of knowing decolonially must be acted out as a bodily, effective, ethical, political, collect collective experience. As decolonial theory evolves from the time space spaces of subalternized difference, as it anchors on the vitality of effects to resist and change knowledge, it grounds firmly on the body and territory. Race is the subjective condition that marks one's inferiorized body. Uh, in coloniality and becomes thus a crucial element in the analytics of decolonial thinking. Also, territory stands as the arsenal of memories, imaginaries, and materialities from where the vi vitality of knowing otherwise draws upon. In this vein, Another asset of decolonial thinking is to veer off to the local as the condition that allows for knowledge production. As some African scholars have asserted, all knowledge is local knowledge, meaning that knowledge bears on its material, relational, and territorial conditions of production to find inspiration meaning and purpose. The discourses about globalization processes, for instance, though seeming to impart an inescap inescapable condition worldwide, actually perform a le legitimating effect of capitalistic reproduction for the accumulation and fruition 
of a smaller and smaller group of people. That accounts for the invisible global coloniality. And thirdly, decolonial critique turns against capitalism as a cornerstone of the processes of European modernity, colonization, and the imperial hegemony of central developed countries. Globalization and neoliberalism stand as incarnations of neocolonialism, and capitalism continues to be the structuring principle of coloniality. One cannot be decolonial whilst remaining silent or partisan of the capitalistic hegemonic rule over the world order. The possibilities of a pluriversal world of a different geopolitical structure of international relations geared to more social justice and equality rest on overcoming the present capitalistic world order. So what's the relevance of decolonial theorizing to childhood studies? I'll draw upon my own work and that of two African scholars, Irene Niamu and Sheila Wamahiu, to argue a kind of reimagining childhood studies from the standpoint of the colonial theories. In my article, Why Global Children and Childhood from a Decolonial Perspective, I undertake a critical evaluation of the present truism of childhood studies, a global child in a global world. The status of the global in the expression global childhood as attests to an abstraction, tacit and supposedly irresistible, albeit inaccurate, since childhoods are locally, locally produced. However, the significant global here performatively pre produces a real form of childhood, one that scholars should necessarily search for, reaffirming and legitimating thus the social and material processes of globalization that underpin this child, childhood production. In this vein, a re-examination of the status of local childhoods seems needed since the local here stands as, a, stands as a position of backwardness with regards to such a global child. I claim that the maintenance of such a paradigm with universal val validity uh, can be accounted for by coloniality, that is, the present structure of the geopolitical division of labor in the production and circulation of scientific knowledge about childhood. Where, first, northern countries stand as authoritative loci of scientific knowledge. Second, the circulation of knowledge is constrained by barriers and impediments towards a truly international scholarly community. Third, the English, Englishization of scientific knowledge and established American Eurocentric normativities with regards to what topics, concepts, and theories should be used and investigated. Fourth, the extraversion syndrome of Southern researchers, researchers that legitimizes the uncritical reception of metropolitan knowledge in the peripheric countries, among other aspects. Thus, uh, this paper critically analyze, analyzes the marginalized position of Southern researchers with respect to knowledge production. 
directing my critical lens towards more specific aspects, another article of mine uh, named uh, Writing Adult Wrongs, Generationing on the Battlefield, a Decolonial Approach, examines how the singularity of modernization processes in Brazil impacts on the formation of generational structures. Differently from central countries, where the latter configurated certain specific intergenerational positionalities and relationships, in Brazil, the formation of generational structures has been inflected by historical processes of slavery, racism, and new colonial pacts. The, the generational analytics in countries like Brazil has to be critically aware of the singularity of the generational structures consequential of such historical and geographical context. By analyzing the empirical results of research of the students' occupation strikes in Brazil, in Brazilian schools in 2016, I come up with the concepts of co-generativity and politicized gener uh, generativity as ways to further complexify and understand the notion of generation as forwarded by European scholars, and the formation of singular generational structures in modern Brazil. Another example comes from my chapter, Children, Childhood and Decolonial Theory, in the forthcoming edited book of Balgopalam, Wall and Wells, uh, the Bloomsbury Handbook of Theories in Childhood Studies. Here, I raise the issue that these two social Latin American movements, the Rural Landless Workers Movement in Brazil, the MST, and the Zapatista Movement in Mexico, reinscribe the precarious status of Southern childhoods in a different analytical key one of political struggle in pursuit of a different society and alternative futures. Thus, children together with adults build up in the present society, uh, in the present, a society at odds with our capitalistic order towards a vision of human collective autonomy, buen vivir and hope. Through their localized political struggles in the southern part of the world, that is, from the site of a colonial difference, that a global critical perspective of the possibilities of present humanity, its future and nature can be foregrounded. The global economic subjective and ecological crisis demands a firm option towards decolonizing knowledge, futures, and ways to inhabit this world. It is as if the children would say, it is from the position of the marginalized, othered, that we can affirm that another world is possible and live up to its ideals. Undoubtedly, Contemporary children's political struggles in the global north, when they make marches, petitions, and protests for sustainable development and climate, climate security, they are also critical of the present World War order. However, for MST and Zapatista children, it is from the perspective of being out of childhood, out of consumerism, out of being a rights holder, that is a generalized condition of being another and made inferior, that the critique towards the capitalistic system is possible 
and can be addressed and also lived out. And being made from this exact standpoint of being positioned in the borders, that such a critique can problematize not only the present economic and political regime, but also the place of childhood and its generational value in, within it. Finally, my African colleagues, Niamu and Wamahyu, present a critique of the juvenile justice system in Kenya, arguing that it's based on colonial practices, like the coercive violence for the maintenance of law, compulsory schooling, normative child, child rights standards. They see child protect protection systems as a power-laden process where certain knowledges are privileged and others silenced. They say, uh, beginning of commas, adopting a child rights discourse is not enough, end of comma. Thus, coloniality, neoliberal ideologies, and anti-poor mindsets, they say, intertwine to maintain universal canons and practices, like, for instance, the normativity of compulsory schooling and child rights discourse. As concluding remarks, I would underscore that decoloniality of knowing, being, feeling can be an option to the construction of new epistemologies and ontologies. It is a powerful geopolitical critique of forms of knowledge derived from localized conditions of production which serve specific demands and interests. It leads to pluriversal narratives of childhood, futures, economies, and ecologies. And it stands as an analytics of resistance to forms of knowledge that underpin domination structures. So I come to the end. Thank you very much.